worked with many of you, and I'm sure many people on the, that are watching by um, by uh, in our live stream. I'm Walter Lohman, director of the Asian Studies Center or Heritage Foundation. Um, as director, I want to start out first here by by uh, recognizing all the hard work that's gone into this into this program, putting this conference together. Uh, first, to Jeff Smith, our um, our South Asia fellow, who I'm sure you are also very familiar with. Um, and if you're not familiar with him, you should get familiar with him because, as big a mark as he's making now on the on the U.S. India scene in South Asia and the Indo Pacific scene generally, he's destined to make a much bigger mark. So if you don't know Jeff, um, and I'd be shocked if you don't, but if you don't know Jeff, you should get to know him because he's he's really top rate. Uh, secondly, I want to express appreciation to ORF, um, especially to Samir Saran and our partners, uh, other partners there, especially Pushan Das, who's been on the spot for organizing this event, having been in that sort of role and situation many times myself in the past, especially in previous lives, I know how nerve-wracking it can be to have to put something together like this. Uh, so I, I want to appreciate, uh, express some appreciation to the organizers. Um, I also want to recognize the long and productive partnership that we have had with ORF going back now uh, some 10 years back to when Lisa Curtis was here as our, as our senior fellow for, for South Asia. Um, ORF, of course, is kind of promiscuous in the sense it has many partners. I think it's partners, I think it's partners with every organization in Washington. Uh, we only have a couple on the Indian side, and uh, ORF is really a critical one, and we're so proud of the work that we've been able to do uh, with them over the years. So I just wanted to make, uh, make a couple of those uh, uh, sort of um, uh, announcements up front here. But uh, for our next panel, uh, I'm really pleased to be leading a discussion on the economic side of, of the relationship uh, uh, between the U.S. and India. There's always been tensions in the relationship um, or, or issues. I, th I think some of that is structural, um, sort of inevitable differences we're going to have on the economic side, differences that we, we need to work through. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the tensions over the last couple of years have reached a level that surprised uh, most watchers of, of U.S.-India uh, relations. Um, some of that, as I say, may be, may be inevitable given the differences in our economy, the economies, the, um, the politics in, in both countries, where the consensus and sort of uh, instincts are in India on trade issues. Uh, they're different than many people in Washington. And then you have in the U.S. the turn to protectionism uh, and industrial policy and, and a much more confrontational approach to gaining market access. I think if we're honest, we've got to recognize that that's a really big part of the, the place where we find ourselves uh, right now. Um, I hope we can get into both the, the structural issues and uh, the broader economic picture, uh, sort of enveloping U.S.-India economic um, relations, trade trade issues. But I hope we can look at some of the trade issues specifically as well in this in this session. First, we're going to hear from uh, managing director of Facebook India, Ajit Mohan. Uh, just a couple of highlights from your bio, which I got from your Facebook profile page. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it should be accurate. I should have sent you something. No, no, that's all right. That's all right. Uh, Ajit is a former CEO of a company called Hotstar, an Indian video streaming service. Um, he's educated in the United States at SAIS and UPenn, as well as uh, NTU in Singapore. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing his perspective on, on these issues. And then we'll hear from Rick Rossell. Rick is no stranger to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, in, in fact, Honestly, I don't know anyone in town who knows this set of issues better than Rick. If I ever have a question, he's the first person that pops to mind, somebody I can call to get some advice on and where we are. He's the third person I call when you ask me that. So. There you go. Okay. So, so it's a, Sorry. It's a uh, virtuous circle here. Um, but, uh, but Rick is senior advisor and Wadwani chair in U.S.-India policy studies at CSIS. Uh, before joining CSIS in 2014, he spent 16 years in a variety of roles focused on U.S.-India economic relations, including at McLarty, New York Life, and the U.S.-India Business Council. Then we'll turn to uh, turn to Rick's uh, guru, uh, Ila Putnik. Uh, 
Uh, Ela is professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. She has a long list of professional accomplishments, and so I won't go into all of them. But let me just say that before joining the Institute in 2006, she was economics editor of the India Express, 2004 to 2006. And she's also served intermittently um, as a visiting scholar at the IMF. I know that in your bio, 2003, 2010, 2013. I think that's a very important credential for, for this discussion. Um, so with that, uh, why don't we get started? I'll turn it over to Ajit. We'll have seven, eight minutes each, and then we'll try to have a conversation. Thank you. Um, and thank you to both Heritage and ORF for having me. Uh, the last time I was in DC was uh, a year after 9-11. Uh, the world looked quite different. And, and it was 2002, uh, the year leading up to the war in Iraq. Um, it, and, and, and for me, uh, you know, sort of 17 years later, so much has changed. And one of the big things that has changed is on the technology front. And, and one of the frameworks that I wanted to introduce to this conversation today was a lot of the focus on US-India trade has been uh, on elements of the trade relationship over the last 15 and 20 years. And, and really, the question really is, what are going to be the new elements that will guide the relationship over the next 10, 15, 20 years? If, if you look at even the current conversation in terms of both the areas where the two governments are aligned, where the two countries are aligned, and the areas where there are disputes, a lot of it is on manufacturing, some of it on services, but not a lot of conversation related to digital. And, and for me, I think one of the big things that's happened in the last three years in India that I'm not sure has really landed in terms of the extent of the transformation of the Indian economy is the massive expansion in access to affordable 4G. Uh, first led by Reliance Geo, uh, the telecom company, and then followed by uh, others in, 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 in the telecom space. And literally in three years, it, uh, Geo launched as a trial service in September of 2016. Uh, and literally in three years, the number of people who had access to mobile broadband moved from something less than 10 or 15 million to a number that is close to 500 million today. That's a dramatic transformation that's happened in a very short period of time. And in many ways, because it's happened in a very short period of time, it's not clear that the world has kind of understood the, the, the extent in which it has already transformed the Indian economy. And in many ways, the opportunity inherent in transforming the economy even further over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, just on that back of the movement from 5 million to 500 million, we have seen an explosion in access to new services. Uh, nearly eight companies that have crossed more than a billion in valuation, M massive interest and excitement in the venture space. But more than all of that, I think what's fundamentally happened if you look at the world, if you look at the, if you look at the world from an internet economy point of view, there is the US, there is Europe, and in a world where the Chinese internet is closed off to the rest of the world, the third pole is India. So China, of course, is extremely consequential. It has a thriving internet economy. But reality is the model that China has built is quite different from the rest of the world. There is a, there is a walled garden. And of course, you know, it has created massive successes uh, that's now being exported outside of China. But for for anyone sitting in the US or, or looking at the internet economy in terms of what is ac accessible, it's really North America, Europe, and now India. And, and what's really happening is this, this kind of scale in terms of access to broadband, where 500 million people have come online, and it's quite conceivable that in a very short period of time, that number could move from 500 million to a billion, 
also means that it is going to throw up fundamentally new models in commerce and payments uh, in terms of how people engage with each other, how people transact. And therefore, the opportunity is pretty dramatic, both for Indian companies, for American companies, but also the opportunity to create models that may actually originate in India. Just the scale of the access to the internet means and, and, and the stage at which the access is happening in terms of the, the evolution of the Indian economy means companies will be creating innovation that frankly may not be happening at this pace and with this depth in many other markets. Just to give you an example, uh, one of the services that uh, uh, Facebook owns, WhatsApp, the WhatsApp payments is being built on UPI, which is a very local tech stack built for India. And, and uh, India is the first market. Uh, uh, we're waiting for regulatory approval, but we're, we're hoping WhatsApp payments will be live in India before it goes live in any other market. And, and it essentially creates a peer-to-peer -peer payment model, the scale of which would not have been seen anywhere else outside of probably China. So that's the other point to make, that the, not just the pace of the transformation in a short period of time, not just the scale of the investment opportunity available that will come on the back of it, but also that it will create the emergence of new models that will be exciting for both Indian and American companies, and those models may be quite relevant in Latin America and in Africa, and frankly, even in North America and, and Asia and, and, and Europe. So what that means is it kind of raises the question on what does that mean for US-India trade? If, if, if fundamentally we're looking at uh, the internet economy powering a lot of the growth over the next 5, 10, 15 years, and what does that mean for the relationship between India and the US? And, and the, the, one of the big questions that's being negotiated now, uh, which has started as a debate in India, which may not have really shown up on the India-US uh, trade conversation, but uh, will probably be a, a big part of it over the next five, 10 years is, how do we think about data? And, and the, there's a history of data flows between India and the world, India and the US, that have happened organically, naturally, over the last 10, 15 years, uh, both from a consumer lens as well as from uh, business transactions. And yet, there is now a very live debate in India in terms of should we, as a country, be looking at the learnings from China in terms of all of the success that China has seen? And is there a need to replicate that model in India, which at least an interpretation of that would be Let's find a way to build a wall uh, around the internet in India, including limiting and constraining data flows. Uh, and, and I think the real question is, and, and it's, it's a consequential choice, and there's an argument to be made that India and Indian companies will have some success uh, following that model. I think our belief is that India and Indian companies, and, and India is a law, uh, as a country, its interests are served even better by making sure that it remains open, that it creates models where data flows uh, uh, move across India and the US and the world with certain guidelines and rules, of course. There's no question that the ongoing conversation on privacy and how do we protect user data is quite a consequential one. And there are enough models in US and Europe, and frankly, enough uh, depth of thinking in India that could influence that. Uh, but the, the fundamental question is, can US and India construct a model for the world that is centered on the openness, the spirit of entrepreneurship that has served both countries well, and the extent to which it, it will influence the trade conversation? And in that process, can the two countries create a model for what the new rules of the internet could be for the world? Uh, that frankly could be an alternative uh, uh, to the framework that China has offered. Uh, let me ask you something. Maybe it would be a good segue into Rick's uh, comments, but um, your views on that don't surprise me. It's sort of a new economy approach and something somebody in your position and with your background would obviously uh, 
see and, and want to bring people's attention to. Um, but can these old issues, these old things that drive uh, India's economy and trade relations, especially goods exports and, and imports, um, can they really be left behind as, as issues? Or, and, do they, um, and do they stand in the way of moving on to the issues that, like you say, will really be driving India's future. Um, and, then, and then secondly, um, is this the kind of advice you're giving the Indian government? That is, you know, lay off some of these issues that put you at odds with the other members of the RCEP and put you at odds with the United States and everyone else and let's focus on the future. Are you giving the same advice to the, the Indian government? Yeah, I, I think uh, two quick reactions. I think on, on the... Uh, on the first one, for me, this is an addition. Uh, I, I don't think it's a substitution to the, you know, uh, to the conversation on manufacturing export of goods. Uh, I, I think this is just an addition because it recognizes that a lot of the Indian economy will be powered by the internet over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, as it, it will in the US. And therefore, uh, this is a layer that we need to now start thinking about. So I don't see it as one versus the other. I think on the second front, um, I, I, I think the, the Indian government has, has depth in thinking about this. Um, I, I'm not sure whether they need advice from a company like us, but I think if we were asked that advice, I, we genuinely feel uh, good in advocating for this position that it's actually good for India, uh, that, that we are not looking at this from a self-interested lens. Uh, I think we would argue that keeping uh, the internet open in India, allowing for uh, data flows with you know, guidelines that are centered on privacy is the right answer for India. So I, I would not argue that this is the right answer for America or American tech companies. Uh, I think it, it, when India has done so much in terms of building the foundation for the internet economy in terms of just moving access from zero to 500 million, I think a framework that is centered on openness is the best way to kind of explore growth and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, certainly, uh, it's a position that certainly sort of um, dovetails with the United States position generally, that is, on, on data flows yeah. and, and, and enabling that that has for the economy. Uh, okay, well, Rick, let me let us hear from you. Uh, I will touch on uh, boring old goods trade, um, since that seems to be kind of the driver on, on where things are at right now. Um, we are in today a moderate intensity trade war. And, uh, you know, with Modi's trip and people talking about the deal, I get a lot of American journalists that don't follow the India beat that call and say, is India the next target? Those of us that are in the trenches, like, you know, there's already bombs dropping, you know, there's already bullets whizzing by. It's, uh, it's pretty serious, not to the China extent, but pretty serious. And um, so, you know, here to kind of break things down in a little bit more detail, um, India did make itself a mark in this fight, uh, speak, saying that as a friend to India. Um, you know, I think a lot of times when I'm in Delhi, people are quick to chalk this up to the fact that we have a president that has picked a lot of irrational fights on trade. A lot of partners where we have trade surpluses, where they've got low trade barriers and they've been targeted, don't know why. Others were, you know, it's a valid trade fight. Um, but if you look at uh, the track record, even before President Trump was elected, um, Prime Minister Modi is the least pro-trade prime minister that India has had since liberalization began. Uh, first months in office the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, to uh, adopt a measure that had been approved by the previous government, delayed global Im implementation of this WTO deal because India wanted a single country carve out for ag subsidies. You've seen an expansion of compulsory local manufacturing rules. Many were adopted before Modi came in, but expanded in areas like electrical power equipment and uh, uh, steel uh, import substitution rules, um, even shipping containers. There's a rule now where domestically made shipping containers get priority and being leased by the Indian government. Who knew that one? It's not on the list, but it's something real that's happened there that some company out there in the world is saying, like, I lost my market, you know? Um, you, you've seen areas, too, that uh, clearly is on the United States list on things like uh, price caps, um, tariffs, the last two budgets. I mean, look at uh, the 2018 budget that India released. 49 product groups where India doubled customs duties, cars, cosmetics, and a lot of stuff in between. So, you know, it isn't just simply that uh, India is the next in line and we've always had issues and it's another bunch. Um, India has taken more steps to close the market on trade than either the Vajpayee or, or Prime Minister Singh governments, both of whom I work very closely with. So you do see those steps on trade that are really kind of triggering this. That's fuel that this administration 
certainly would use. This is not going to be given a pass like it might have been with uh, with previous administrations to some extent. And again, it's not to say like Modi has done, and I give him a lot more credit than most analysts, big domestic reforms, coal, oil and gas, GST, bankruptcy, big domestic reforms, huge foreign investment reforms. He made more than 40 positive steps on FDI caps during his five years in office, twice the rate of either Vajpai or Singh in either term. So not saying like it's all bad either, but on trade in particular, on goods trade in particular, you've seen a lot of steps that have really helped to fuel the base of the trade fight that's out there right now. Um, you know, I think when, when Trump first came in, too, and a lot of people tried to say, well, make an India and make America great again, that can work together. And like, I'm pulling my hair out if I had any. Like, no, <laughs> these two things do not. Like, it, it's not going to work. Um, and it took a little while, I think, until the fight really started to gear up. But now you see kind of both sides taking it in earnest. Um, you know, is there the opportunity for a trade deal when they're there? I mean, we've got a lot of small issues. Maybe they can soak up a few of them. The question is, would Modi sign an agreement that is one-sided, where India makes concessions and the United States does not. In the United States, the threshold for things like restoration of GSP, like promising we won't move on on on, uh, um, on immigration or something like that, you know, for, I think for the United States side, like the threshold for putting something on paper is a little bit higher. So I'm fascinated to see what actually transpires in New York or Houston and if they can actually capture a deal. Because it can't be just India showing up with a piece of paper that says, yes, we'll do the 10 things, leave us alone. Um, you know, what will the United States put on the table? Because uh, both of us have things we've done and things that we're contemplating doing. I think both sides have mostly been teeing up more arrows than looking for solutions in recent months. Now for the good news on trade. Trade's going great. <laughs> get out of D.C. and get out of Delhi, and you're going to find out that U.S.-India trade, goods trade, hit $94 billion bucks in the month that just ended. $94 billion over 12 months. All-time record. Up double digits. U.S. exports are up by more than 20% in that period. So somehow we are defying gravity. When you double customs duties, when you slap new duties, 232 tariffs, things like that, revoke GSP, these are real things. I've been in private sector my whole life since I left college. You can't do these things without having an impact on trade. But so far, we're not having an impact on trade. And among our 20 largest trading partners, exports to India grew fastest. So. Uh, you know, I do like to make, keep in mind, and anytime I sit down with my own government interlocutors, I say, like, keep up the pressure. Uh, India is doing these things are real. But at the same time, like, don't go too far, because a lot of American companies are finding India to be one of the fastest growing export markets in the world right now. So we are defiance of gravity. Now, both of our countries have massive trade deficits, and this is what it's all about. India is not doing this because they hate America. They're doing it because they've got the largest trade deficit in the world of any large economy. Almost 10% of GDP in recent years off and on, anywhere between 7 to 10%. That's the size of India's goods trade deficit. Enormous. Blows ours out of the water by orders of magnitude. So they're reacting to something very real. And I know lots of great trade economists that can sit there and tell me, well, you can't look at you know, the imports and exports. There's a deeper way to do it. But no leader in the world does, right? There's the number, imports and exports, minus that. And that's what they kind of react to. So uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, these deficits, um, you know, both of us have massive deficits. It's going to take a lot more energy to try to figure out longer term, can we survive as trade partners? Companies sure want it. You see the numbers showing that. Um, I think that uh, we're, we're, we're sliding down a bit of a steep hill right now in, in trade ties, at least between our capitals. And so far, nobody's been able to figure out how to get a grip. But for me, you know, I do think in particular, you look at something that we need to start tying our arms around, something big like China's Made in China 2025. That, to me, should be the tie that binds us. We're not going to do a big trade deal with India that covers everything. China has a strategy right now to destroy global manufacturing and emerging technologies, and we're all going to be eating their lunch if they're successful. Huawei is the pointy edge of the spear that everybody's focused on, but I mean, China right now has a plan to drive global adoption of their technologies on medical devices, on robotics, on batteries, that kind of thing. You know, both the United States and India lost out on solar production and other things like that. There's a whole new wave that's going to hammer our manufacturing sectors over the next 20 years. Maybe we can find some bridges to bear on that. So find something, maybe China 2025, maybe something else. we got to find something that our strategic and our, and our econ communities can agree on is the challenge that we both share and begin working up from there. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. You know, I'm a, I'm a free trade fundamentalist, I have to say. Um, I think there is a way to reconcile 
make America great and make in India, and it's through the application of the concept of comparative advantage. Yeah. Right. Maximize the the application of it, and, and we can make both work. The, the problem with it is that you take the decisions about which industries, which rent seekers get supported, you take that out of the the um, the, the hands of the government, and that's why politicians are involved in it to begin with, basically. That's well, kind of strange. Like the sectors that Modi has really kind of put a lot of his effort on in this uh, uh, Made in India campaign. I mean, you look at the initial sectors, and they're talking about semiconductors and IT equipment, that kind of stuff, right? So they're like the sectors where India wants to focus on blocking imports, creating local. Like those are the areas that we still want to be good in. The areas that we have, uh, you know, I think the United States has started to give up on of, you know, textiles and things that have went other places, like um, India has not applied its mind on how to be dominant in those areas nearly as much as Bangladesh has. So uh, I do agree with you. So far, like both of our leaders, though, they want to dominate the same spaces. But uh, I think you're right. There's a lot of space there where if we were to find some balance. Right, yeah, interesting. <laughs> uh, thank you to ORF and the Heritage Foundation for having me here. Uh, I'll go back to digital trade uh, after Rick's uh, very interesting assessment uh, of the current situation on goods trade, which is really, really important. Now, today, digital flows, cross-border digital flows, are among the fastest growing cross-border flows in the uh, ever. Uh, they're growing faster than flows of goods and services, uh, of uh, labor and capital. So despite the fact that we had these uh, very large capital flows through the uh, past the GF, uh, post the GFC, uh, today the biggest uh, flows that are emerging are digital flows. We haven't, as economists, uh, you know, we are still struggling with the last century's problems, which is how to make uh, the free flow of goods, services, labor, and capital uh, work, and how to make globalization work in those. And then now suddenly we are faced with this huge new challenge of digital flows, which are really a complex issue. Even if they were not cross-border, actually, even regulating them while uh, trying to grapple with the issues of privacy, security, um, would still have been a huge challenge. But it's these challenges are much bigger because these are cross-border flows. Uh, I just want to comment uh, bef you know, during this on what uh, Rick said about uh, trade uh, in goods and how we are putting restrictions. And I think and I hope that maybe in digital flows as well, uh, our politicians and our leaders are wise enough to maybe do all the right or wrong talk but not really affect uh, trade flows. As you said, that trade is still booming. Maybe we are defying gravity. So let's hope that that uh, happens in the digital space as well. Uh, these flows are very, very important. Why? Because uh, they're giving us huge productivity gains. India is one of the biggest gainers, I can uh, certainly say, using WhatsApp, using Gmail. Uh, we're certainly seeing huge productivity gains. We have been uh, the beneficiaries of innovations that have happened elsewhere in the world. And we hope to continue to be beneficiaries of these. Companies gain hugely because they can monitor uh, their production chains. Uh, they can benefit consumers, uh, provide services based on consumer preferences, um, research. I mean, the innumerable, innumerable ways in which uh, we gain. When I, as an Indian academic, look at what the Chinese uh, have compared to what we have, I feel relieved that we haven't actually stopped. While we might be in the danger of you know, having uh, speed bumps, but we haven't really stopped uh, an open access to the internet uh, the way uh, you know the Chinese model, or I think as Ajit said, we are discussing that and asking whether that's a model that we should have, but we haven't uh, gone there yet. Now, actually, many countries I uh, believe more than fifty countries have put restrictions on uh, data flows. Some have put restrictions on uh, data fl health data flows. So for example, Australia requires health data to be 
localized. Uh, others have data localization requirements for tax uh, information. Maybe the US or, and some European countries do that. Uh, some other countries say that uh, there should be restrictions on data unless the consumer has given consent to use that data and that it could, uh, not to use, but that it could be uh, taken out of uh, the country. So it is, India has restrictions on uh, payments data and asks for has proposed localization data localization for data on payments and that's uh, one big area of concern that has emerged in recent times now there are a number of reasons why uh, the, such restrictions get uh, proposed now these uh, reasons could be uh, security uh, ostensibly that's the most important reason that is given that uh, you know you hear that surveillance agencies want that they should be able to access information uh, for security reasons uh, the, the second set of reasons could be privacy so without the consent of the customer you don't want his data to go out a third set of reasons reasons could be plain and simple mercantilism I mean, protection. So there's a nascent domestic industry that looks at the Chinese model and thinks, wow, you know, all there's this huge market. You know, you often hear this data is oil uh, phrase. So there's this huge market and it should be domestic industries. And, and we've seen this movie before. I mean, it's uh, India used to have uh, domestic companies making cars. Uh, Pre 1991, we did not allow foreigners to uh, have, uh, produce cars in India. We've seen uh, situations where we did not allow imports because it was felt that the market should be captured by domestic companies. So it could be a number of uh, these, mainly these three reasons why uh, you find um, uh, restrictions. Now, turning to uh, what uh, would be the interests of India and along with that, uh, the US. Uh, so as I said, India has been one of the biggest beneficiaries of globalization. And uh, you know, if we are able to work out rules-based systems through which we can address the concerns we might have on privacy, on security, then it would be in India's interest. And we don't need Facebook to tell us that. We know that. We've you know, done all kinds of unilateral trade reforms uh, and liberalization since 91. Uh, Rick might get unhappy seeing what happened in the last five years. But for those of us who've been looking at the last 25 years, we are certainly much better off than where we were doing unilateral trade reforms. And I think even now, some of the areas in which the restrictions are put are not maybe, you know. Still below bound rates, not illegal. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So uh, India is a, going to be a huge beneficiary. But for that, what we need is uh, a partnership. A partnership in based on shared values based on the values of having an open uh, and free digital economy, based on uh, respect, uh, respecting the rights uh, of privacy uh, of the users and the citizens, and based on rule of law. So even if their uh, security agencies require surveillance, it should be based on due process. Now, these are challenges. These are challenges even within an economy. Even if one was not to think of the Indian government and the US government collaborating on building such rules-based systems. Even if one was to think of a domestic, uh, just, just the Indian economy, uh, just the Indian government trying to, you know, while uh, balancing uh, right to privacy, civil liberties, and at the same time, giving uh, powers to surveillance agencies for uh, security reasons, it would still be a challenge. I think that these are challenges that we have to face. These are opportunities and challenges that we should, as two countries that have shared values, and based on these principles and democratic principles, we should come together and have a dialogue. 
My sense is it's not going to be a one-off thing. I completely agree with Samir, who yesterday suggested that we should do uh, have a joint uh, proposal for the uh, G20 that uh, on the digital economy. But I think that this is something that we'll have to do on a continuous basis. I mean, while it can start with a working group that comes up with a joint proposal, this century is going to throw up huge challenges. And we'll, we'll have differences, and we will diverge, and we will converge. But I think in the long term, really, because we have shared values, because we don't want to go the Chinese model way. We certainly don't want to go. I mean, if, we, if circumstances are such that hostilities get created, if we stop talking to each other, if we are not communicating well enough, and that results in us doing that, I think it would be a huge tragedy. So we should set up forums, institutionalize them, have platforms. This can be the place to begin, because I think one of the mandates for uh, this session was to identify measures to alleviate tensions and provide a long-term roadmap for a consensus on this, that we could just begin with a dialogue which would be something that would be continuous, where people could bring their concerns uh, back, and that could provide ultimately a rules-based system for cross-border flows for the world, uh, data flows for the world, and not just for these two countries. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, you know, you mentioned that over the long term, we will converge and diverge, and you know, the relationship will continue, and, and I, I believe that in a lot of United States relationships. In fact, uh, as unpopular as it may be to say, I think it's the same in our relationship with China. It's going to diverge and converge and it's gonna go through cycles over time. The, the challenge is that we don't get into a shooting war in the process. Um, but, uh, but on trade issues, um, if we each pursue um, very domestic, domestically focused um, protectionists, whatever you want to call it, trade policies, we're really going to diverge much more than we converge. If, if there's consensus in both of our societies that we need, that the government needs to determine which sectors are most important, and that, you know, that's just a recipe for conflict over, uh, over an extended period of time until we get back to some consensus around liberalization. Because in liberalization, you find convergences. Right, because you can find your your, your uh, natural advantages, and, and and capital can flow to where it is most efficient. Um, I wanted to come back to the issue about, um, and you, you talked about it at some length, and, and maybe Ajit has some thoughts on this too, about finding some common rules around digital trade, the con uh, um, sort of forging some agreement on those, and of, of course that would be more than just the U.S. India; it would have to involve bigger group that maybe U.S. India could serve as a core, uh, a core of. But what are the, um, what are the forums for us to, to do that in? I, 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 you mentioned Samir's reference to the G20, but G20 is a really big thing with big pronouncements, and I don't know that it's going to have the uh, capacity to get down to the nitty-gritty of the issues that are involved. Where is it you would propose that we try to get into the details of that? So I think the way the world is arranged today is that you have the WTO, which where this does not fit, and uh, then we are now, in fact, focusing far more on bilateral uh, treaties or you know small regional agreements. Uh, so this could be a completely new uh, arrangement. And it doesn't quite work at a bilateral. Yeah, it doesn't because it doesn't work in a bilateral way. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we, we did it with, with Europe um, when the first EU privacy directive came out. You know, we, we signed a um, an agreement that we didn't have to comply fully with European law. We were able to self-certify. I don't remember all the details for it. So the United States did it with Europe with the original privacy directive. I'm sure there's probably somebody in the audience that knows more about this. I fought that back in the day a little bit when Indy was thinking about some privacy stuff. But there is one example I know of, which I'm not sure exactly how much it overlaps, but a little bit. Yeah, but I'm not sure that WTO is at least at least today when we think of trade. I mean, it's not even doing services very well. So I don't think that that is the platform. And now we're going much further ahead. So perhaps you know, think of a new platform. Think I think the reason G20 was mentioned was uh, it did come up in a fairly material way, cross-border data flows on the previous G20. I think in in Japan, 
so at least I guess it was a recognition at a global forum for the first time, but I agree that probably it introduces the question of where would this best be negotiated. Uh, but, you know, clearly there are some elements of it, I think, that are that have to be resolved within nation states, some bilateral, and a lot of it, especially when it comes to data flows, which then becomes truly multilateral. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, G20 and, and Samir's idea in terms of can we orchestrate the G20 in India in the couple of years before that as a mechanism to go deep into the different layers of this mm -hmm. uh, does seem like a relevant one. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking less in terms of regulation setting and compliance yeah. and that sort of thing than building consensus on the rules. Because, uh, and then it's up to the domestic domestic governments, uh, national governments to implement, right? And to let that guide what they're doing. Because now it seems like it's developing its own momentum. And India has restrictions, and then Vietnam has restrictions, and then that serves as an example to others. Uh, so it, it is, it, there is a consensus developing organically, and it's not generally a good one. India doesn't have too many restrictions. I mean, I, I want to agree with Ila. Um, I, 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 maybe I should have flagged my passport as well, Ila. Uh, waved my Indian passport uh, before I made my point. But uh, I agree with her that, uh, India doesn't have too many restrictions at the moment. At, at least my observation was, I think there's a, there's a debate going on in terms of a framing of, if we look at the next 15, 20 years, which path should we uh, choose? Um, I, I think the only place where, uh, for example, if we take data localization, uh, a material one is this payments localization. Mm -hmm. uh, but in many ways, the payments localization, I think, does follow uh, some of the architecture of payments uh, even from the past. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not entirely new. And, and for, for example, for us, on WhatsApp payments, we are complying with payments localization. We have accepted that uh, uh, that's, you know, we're going ahead and doing it. So I, I would kind of push back. Uh, I think it's a live debate. I, I don't think there are too many restrictions that have been placed at the moment. So, you know, that's why if I may uh, come in here to your question, India, US is a good place to start. You know, so to start this discussion on, you know, because both have uh, shared concerns about privacy and surveillance. And because we haven't, India hasn't yet started, uh, you know, we, we, we've only begun discussing it. It is a good place to start, which perhaps will not be the case if you bring in uh, many other countries where, uh, you know, if you bring in China. So... Well, yeah, that, that, would, that wouldn't be the first place to start. That, that's for well, sure. I mean, from India's perspective, too, I mean, they'd want to come to the table on this because, I mean, of the $100 billion IT industry, 85% of the exports come to the United States. So uh, there's a natural complementarity mm -hmm. on the two of us. From India's vantage point, I think from the U.S. vantage point, would we start with India if we could pick the world in any country? Maybe not, but that's the uh, energy and effort that folks like us on the Indie Beat have to uh, compel in this town. <laughs> and for service exports, this is critical. And, you know, while India has this huge trade deficit in terms of goods, but India is a huge service exporter. So, for uh, you know, data flows are critical for service exports for India. So, this would be a very good place to start. Right. Right. Um, there's also a connection to goods exports, ultimately, because you've got to have Absolutely. the goods shipped when you buy them on Amazon or, or wherever they're come, coming from someplace. And they're also serviced, as you know, we know from call centers and, and, and the back, back office uh, processing, that sort of thing. Um, but um, I wanted to focus back again on the, uh, the old-fashioned goods <laughs> trade. Um, so the, there's been a little bit of discussion over the last year or so over the nature of uh, new tariffs that the Indians have have imposed on on um, imports, um, and I'm asking Rick this. Obviously, anyone can chime in, but I'm asking Rick in particular because he is focused on on goods to, to a large degree. Um, how much is India bumping up against its WTO commitments, its ITA commitments? Um, because I think there's a good case to be made that at least on ITA, it's in violation. Uh, but I know a lot of Indian commentators and Indian government often say no. Yeah. 
So what, what is, how do you see A lot of the tariff hikes have been within the bound rates in the WTO. There have been some challenges, particularly, you know, I mean, goods that when the ITA was created, I mean, your phone did one thing and your computer did another thing. And when you got the blending, you know, like what's right and what's wrong? Is it a computer equipment or is it a phone? So there's some areas of blending that didn't just try to say it's not really what was envisioned under the ITA. And uh, there's another product list, which I haven't seen, but was announced this year in the budget, where you know India announced whole hog that all these IT products that had zero customs duty were India now manufacturers. The finance minister announced that they would begin putting tariffs on those products too. So what all that encompasses, I don't know if there's actually been a list of those things released, but I mean, I read that in the budget speech and I'm just like, oh, this could open up. I mean, things are not getting better when you announce that you know, you're gonna start hiking on all these other, uh, all these other areas. So. Uh, there have been some challenges. Uh, I think India defends itself, saying that it's a lot of products that merge together, and it's tough to say whether it was what was considered under ITA or is it something new because you brought two things together. Um, and then the other shoe to drop is this announcement in this most recent budget. What's going to be covered under this blanket that anything India produces on IT um, would, would, would be subject. But uh, by and large, if you're looking for the product lines too, I mean, mostly, it's the things that India pro uh, imports pretty heavily. This is where the onion gets a little bit tougher to unpack because, you know, it is the trade deficit with China, which is equivalent to about 3% of India's GDP. That's the trade deficit with one single country. And, uh, you know, some of what is produced in China and exported to India, too, is made by American companies. So if they say, well, ultimately, this is a China move, but it still impacts American firms. So uh, that's where things get a little bit tougher to unpack. Right. You know, I want to... Uh I want to open it up to questions, and I have a few always, but uh, but uh, so I'm ready to go unless we have some. So we have right in the front here. Thank you, Ridhika from uh, Indian Chambers. I have one comment and two questions, if I may. Um, just talking about the data issue, um, I think where the government of India is right now is in a place where it's different from China, where both the regulator and the regulator are talking to each other, trying to figure out what to do because it's a new space, which is a very comfortable thing for somebody like me. But what the other thing, and I have a copyright on this statement, the other thing that I say is that, yeah, I mean, data is the new oil, but oil also gets exported and imported. One doesn't sit on it all the time, right, uh, to figure out. Like Saudi Arabia wouldn't sit on it and say, we have it, so... We'll do what we need to do with it. So that needs to sort of move. And I think that we are in a place in India where they're talking about how to make sure that it's taken full advantage off rather than just sitting on it. But the question is more on, um, and I'm being a devil's advocate, Ajit. What if the government of India gets influenced by the French way and starts taxing on revenue rather than sales on tech companies? What would happen then? Um, and the question to Rick is, you said trade has grown, but why? Does China have to do something with it? I, I think no, but what's your view on it? I'll, I'll go first. I, I think just as a reaction to the first one, and it's interesting how the data is like oil, uh, I, I think it's a metaphor, um, has, has kind of you know moved around a fair bit. Um, Last week, we had uh, Nick Clegg, uh, who's the head of our policy, uh, global policy in India, and his alternative that he offered was data is like water. Um, and, and, and the point was that, you know, it, it's not the value in itself. It is what, what are the services and algorithms that you build on top of it uh, that add value. So I think the, the, I agree with you about, you know, so long as it's mobile and it can flow freely, uh, then it doesn't matter what the metaphor is. Yeah, but I think fundamentally it is, is there value in itself or do you allow it to create value uh, for everyone across boundaries? Um, I don't know, I, I, you know, uh, to your question on taxing revenues. I mean, uh, I imagine that question can be asked not just for tech, but across the board. Um, I, I'm not a tax expert, but, uh, you know, I would kind of frame it as a more broader debate that um, now 15 or 20 years into this first wave of technological innovation, everyone, including governments and regulators, are now getting their head around uh, how do you change the rules that were framed for a very different world uh, that could apply to uh, taxation, it could apply to trade, 
Uh, and and I think generally, at least what I observe sitting inside Facebook and seeing other tech companies is, I think tech companies are recognizing that that conversation with the government needs to happen uh, actively. Uh, that it's a, and I'm not talking about tax, but in general, that it's it's fair to now start navigating what the new rules of the internet should be, because a lot of those rules were designed for an economy that looks quite different from where we are today, not just in India, but around the world. If, if we're taking a vote on metaphors, <laughs> I like water a lot better than oil. <laughs> oil. Oil seems kind of dangerous. None of them are going to be perfect, but water is water sounds much better to me. Uh, Rick, do you want to take the second part of that? Yeah, well, let me just uh, follow up, too, on Ajit's comment. Uh, for the young folks in the room that are looking to get deeper in India policy space, spend a little time learning what cross-border taxation looks like, too, because huge issues. I mean, Ridica's question is fantastic there. I find that, like, you know, time I spent working on cross-border tax issues back when the first bilateral cases started to come up has served me extremely well in my career ever since then because it's one of those areas that it's just a little more technical than most of the D.C. policy wonks like to jump into. But if you can understand what transfer pricing, permanent establishment, the mutual agreement procedure, get some of these things rolling up the tip of your tongue, opens up a whole new area. And when you sit down and talk to companies and you can talk about cross-border tax issues to them, Eyes light up like nothing else that we've talked about up here. Not tariffs, not privacy, not data. Um, so anyways, just a little bit of tip there. The tax stuff, you know, good, good stuff for people's career development. On, uh, on trade, you know, it's a great question, Ritika. Um, you know, I did say divine gravity. You know, all these new customs duties, import things, import substitution, the United States imposing tariffs, removing tariff packages, and yet trade is growing. But, you know, some of that is just because we're two of the largest fastest growing large economies in the world. So all boats rise in that scenario. But in particular, you know, the United States has benefited from strategic choices India has made to buy from America. Oil and gas, defense equipment, those are two areas where in the last couple of years we've seen, you know, a pretty big bump. So is this the kind of deal that we want to make? You know, uh, uh, increased customs duties hurt a lot of American companies in different areas, make it tougher for car companies and cosmetics and IT and telecom companies. But India will directly buy from the United States in these strategic areas. Well, clearly it's not working, you know. So, uh, you know, making those choices while you're making the market a little bit more tougher for uh, for other companies. Um, so, so all boats kind of rise. Uh, specific bumps in in petroleum and gas and defense material. But uh, you know, making those choices to buy strategically in a couple of sectors to offset you know potential limitations in trade in other areas doesn't seem to be winning a lot of favor for Delhi in the current environment. Tanvi, right down in front. Uh, Tanvi Madan from Brookings. Um, I have a couple of questions. One kind of follows up on uh, Ridika's, um, and Ila and Ajit, maybe to you and Rick, if you'd like to answer it as well, which is we've heard a lot about, you know, India would like to take advantage of the U.S.-China trade war. Uh, on both sides, from both sides. We've seen some from the Chinese side giving more kind of market access to agricultural products, et cetera. But what does India need to do to really take advantage of the US-China trade war? Um, and the second question is slightly more philosophical, which is um, about how reconcilable kind of India and the US's interests are in the economic space, given the mood the countries, or at least the government, seem to be in on both sides, which is, I was struck by Prime Minister Modi's Independence Day speech, where he said, you know, oh, we need to export more, uh, but then he says to Indian consumers, you need to buy Indian. And that strikes me as the global mood these days. Everybody wants to export more, and everybody wants to import less. And as Walter was pointing out, that's not exactly how the system, and as Ila pointed out, not just India, everybody's benefited from. It doesn't quite work. And sometimes that strikes me as, well, that's because the beneficiaries of globalization have within countries have been a kind of different. And that's really the jobs question, et cetera. So is this really reconcilable? And where, which kind of baskets of issues that are on the table, that are part of this moderate intensity trade war that Rick talked about, are they very kind of reconcilable? Are things in the basket of not reconcil irreconcilable? And some that you'd have to kind of have kind of some, some give and take, given this mood uh, that the con countries are in right now. Um, what would India have to do to take advantage of the US-China trade war? I mean, so many things. Um, taxation, infrastructure, uh, get rid of a lot of license raj, uh, a lot of uh, capital controls. I mean, there's a list of things. Yes, we can if we do all those things, but then the question is, 
can we do all those things? They have been on our economic reforms agenda for 25 years. We're trying. We've done a few of them. Uh, I'm not saying there's no progress. But, you know, things go slow, steady, maybe not so steady, but at least slow. And, uh, you know, we, we, those of us who follow the reforms process in India have uh, days when we are, you know, we think everything's great and then days where we are just very gloomy. So it will take, uh, you know, a lot of hard work. Now, on uh, the global mood, unfortunately, the mood of protectionism is, you know, there everywhere uh, to be seen. But I think the only way it's reconcilable is if there were no China. So most of the mood, I mean, while, yes, there, will, there are tariffs India is imposing on uh, products from the US, but most of the mood, most of the, the sense, and I'm giving more of uh, not just the $50 billion trade deficit that India has with China, but uh, also the sense that people have, oh, these plastic products, cheap plastic products are filling all retail um, shops in India. And you know those are things that could have been made in India. So most of that mood is coming from the sense that uh, Chinese products are flooding markets. So it, unless you know you have China out, you're absolutely right. It's not; these are not reconcilable. Yeah, too, when we think about the uh, India's economic slowdown and the need for reforms, um, you know, we we a lot of times we sort of pin this on Modi. You know, did he did he do the things that are on the list that everybody's been talking about? But uh, the slowdown, there's 29 people we should be focused on, even more than Modi. 29 chief ministers. Uh, the business environment is driven more by these folks than it is by anything in Delhi. You have access to electricity, health care, the business licenses, 75% of your business licenses. The door knocks you get that slow down production because somebody wants a payout is done by state agencies. It's not done by the federal government. So a lot of the work that India has got to do to create a better manufacturing environment has got to be done by the state chief ministers. Um, you saw some early work in the Modi government in doing that in more powerful ways than I thought were imaginable, this uh, business reform action plan. And um, you, know, you saw the first iteration of it. A few states were at 70 percent. Most states were at like 30 percent of meeting the threshold. But by version three, every state was at 95 percent or higher. So they clearly did not set a terribly high threshold. And they also focused on state self-reporting holding states' feet to the fire to get them to do better. I mean, right now, if anybody's watching the self-destruction of Andhra Pradesh, a state election tearing up every contract for building a new capital city, every power contract that's been signed recently, you see things like that. What's happening in Andhra and things like that happening in other states? You know, if that stuff stops and if the central government and international institutions pay more attention on getting states to do better, if you saw six or seven states really trying harder to win business, you'd see the turnaround immediately because you're investing in Gujarat. You're not investing in India. You're investing in UP. You're investing in Bihar. You're not investing in India. And how is UP compared to Thailand is a more valid question than India to Thailand. So uh, there's a few other folks, too, that I think need to start pulling at yours a little bit in India. And I'd like to see it happen. And there's some great ones that are doing it. There's some great ones that are doing it. You know, Telangana has got a good record. Uh, Vasundra Rajay did some great things during her recent tenure in Rajasthan. You know, you said Naidu again. Um, Qatar and Haryana, you know, labor reforms, land reforms, stuff that Delhi can't do. So there are some winners. You need to get a few more. Yeah. I think that'd be if I add uh, to, uh, to those. Uh, one observation is, even as, you know, there's a bit of a gloom and doom uh, in this, I have to say, even for a company like ours, we have had uh, the ability to uh, build our service uh, over the last few years without uh, too many constraints. So I do want to call that out, um, that... While there is concerns that are future oriented, when you listen to some of the debates, uh, the reality of the moment is uh, a lot of tech companies, including us, we're doing really well. Uh, so I, I do want to kind of uh, separate, and, and I guess it goes to the point that you were mentioning about the, the reality of the trade. I think ELS point earlier, um, I, I, I know there's always a strand of gloom and doom. I feel like this has been an ongoing conversation for hundreds of years. Um, but I think the reality of it is actually quite positive, and that's what we are seeing on the ground. Um, the other one is I do wonder uh, that there seems to be a lot of white spaces for both the India and the U.S. 
uh, to kind of explore together that is linked to the digital economy. Um, I, I know we can very quickly get into cliche territory, but I think with just the scale of the people online, the reality is, um, and, and this is a hypothesis, that some of the difficult conversations can be on stuff that drove our trade in the last 15, 20, 30 years. But there is such unexplored territory where because there is, you know, the opportunities are yet to be grabbed, um, that may orient the conversation towards a more positive manner, which I don't think is currently happening. Uh, and, and for me, again, uh, circling back to, I'm not sure the extent of the transformation in the Indian economy because it's happened in a very short period of time, I don't get the sense that it has landed in DC and in capitals around the world about the scale of the opportunity that it provides. Uh, and, and I think one of the answers is to orient a lot more to the future uh, where the terrain is yet to be explored. Thanks. Actually, with regard to the US-China trade war, I'm actually hoping for an end to it. So I hope it's not a long, around much longer for us to, uh, to seek ways to uh, take advantage of it. And in fact, I would imagine from a business perspective in India, to your question, that's part of the uncertainty you have to calculate because those advantages, so to speak, if you think of them that way, may not be there at the end of the year. And, and the next year, who knows how the US-China relationship develops. I'm not sure you can bank on them, even if that were your, your, um, your intention. Um, other questions? Yeah, right here. <clears throat> you alluded uh, earlier uh, trade as being a comparative advantage. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, uh, even though there is a net benefit to both the partners, there are always losers and uh, winners. Uh, so my question here to Ajit is uh, that uh, Indian IT firms have been beneficiaries all this time uh, of trade. Uh, or, or, and so how much do you think you are obligated to, to influence the Indian government that if they are putting protections in, in goods trade, that it would hurt you because in your counterpart there is going to put uh, protection on what you are exporting. Uh, that's first question. The second one is you sort of said, you said that there is a lot of potential now. There will be a lot of innovation, especially in services and all. IT companies so far have uh, been, in Indian IT companies, have uh, mostly been providing for the lack of any other term, I, I mean, and I shouldn't say it, but it's, it's body shopping. It's basically raw talent of uh, people. Uh, they have not created as many services or service products as such. So can you sort of shed some light about how you see the next generation of uh, innovation in service products that would come out of India? Sure. Um, I, I think uh, on the first one, um, my observation is uh, there are enough public processes involving uh, the government uh, and including industry uh, associations where there are enough conversations between the government and industry associations where this dialogue is ongoing. Uh, so I, I don't see a need to kind of overtly uh, introduce, uh, it almost sounded uh, almost a thread-based uh, framework in, into the discussion. I think our, our uh, observation is the conversations are very thoughtful. Uh, it's detailed. There's a lot of openness to points of view from the private sector. And there are enough uh, fora where these conversations are happening. And we participate in it, like other uh, tech companies and those in the private sector. Uh, so I feel very comfortable uh, that there's an open dialogue happening. Uh, I think on the second one, um, uh, in terms of what could those you know, sources of innovation be. Um, let me just take one. Um, in a world where, uh, let's say, WhatsApp payments comes alive, and I think Ela described that uh, there are businesses who are already engaging on WhatsApp, uh, small enterprises as well as large uh, companies, even though today, for example, WhatsApp itself hasn't created a product framework to enable it. And, and yet, uh, it's being used, uh, for example, to push discovery of products. Um, I can imagine a world in which uh, if, if WhatsApp payments comes alive, 
uh, it could fundamentally change uh, both the model of peer-to-peer -peer payments as well as the larger agenda of financial inclusion in the country. Uh, and it could completely create new commerce models, messaging-based commerce models, uh, where you know those models may be coming out of India and that model could be exported in other parts of the world. Uh, just as an example, one of the companies that we invested in was a company called Misho, which fundamentally is um, people uh, advocating for products to their friends and family on WhatsApp with the, the sale happening between people, uh, including the price, and, and this company essentially acting as a fulfillment arm um, uh, on, on, the, on the back end. Now, these are all models that are only showing up because of the scale of uh, the, the popularity of the messaging platform. And you can imagine the minute you add payments to it, it can really fuel commerce models that the world hasn't seen before. So I think that's just an example that the minute you, you kind of look at 400, 500 million people online, and the minute they are connected in multiple ways and you add financial flows into it, um, you're, you're in a terrain that the world hasn't seen before. So that was a very specific example for you in terms of what that innovation could mean. That's a model that could come out of India that could be exported to the world. Anything on the other? The next big challenge is going to be Libra. So. <laughs> Topic of an entirely different conference, <laughs> I, I think. But a place to start talking, because we know we're going to face it <laughs> soon enough. Uh, let me ask you something, since we talked about China just, uh, just a moment ago. Um, you know, maybe it's because of the people I speak to in Delhi and, and Indian friends here, people, uh, you know, analysts or people associated with the government. Um, I always hear quite an aggressive take on China, and it extends to econ. It's a lot of griping about the trade deficit and other sorts of things, and how the U.S. and India should be working together on the econ side, and even the idea that you know the U.S. should help India become market leaders in certain sectors in order to counter the Chinese, et cetera. So it's this very aggressive attitude on the one hand. On the other, you're engaged in a very complex set of negotiations on a trade agreement with China in the RCEP. So, so which is it? So, 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 so do, you, do you want to be partners with China through the RCEP, or do you want to be? Do you want to confront China as some sort of mercantilist uh, uh, power? Um, and and does that conflict have something to do with the fact that RCEP is now in its seventh year of negotiation? And uh, what, 26, 27 rounds? Because India at this point seems to be the principal obstacle from them, from the negotiators reaching agreement. They announced it'll be done next year, so we're, we're good with that one. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. Yeah, similar every other year. Yeah. The last <laughs> seven years. Right. I was but seven so, years so old the first time. So, so how, does see, how do we see, how should we see China? And, 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 and maybe if, you'd, if you've got some perspective on it specifically, India's involvement in RCEP. I mean, why be a part of that if you are, have this divided mind about dealing with China? It's a complex relationship with China. I think uh, it was in the first panel also this was talked about, that China is a partner. It's not that we are going to stop trading with China. We're going to say we have a you know trade embargo. We're not going to talk to you anymore. No, that's not going to happen. And uh, you know, it goes beyond uh, I mean, China. We have a border with China. We have trade with China. We can get unhappy. We'll gripe. I mean, that's, that's a right. But uh, I don't think that we are going to go in into it uh, treating China as an enemy. So, you know, where, whereas, uh, you know, with Pakistan, we kind of stop trade, we stop uh, the bus, we stop. Whereas with China, it's a growing, deepening trade relationship, which, uh, you know, we might try to bend to our advantage, try to bend it towards to our advantage, but not to stop it. And if you, in fact, now if you look at uh, investment flows from China, they're also big. They, they uh, saw, you know, companies investing in startups in India in many sectors. So it's not going to be something that is a relationship that will be simple or a binary yes or a no. And well, but, but can you reach a trade agreement with China? I mean, the, the news that I heard coming out of Bangkok the last meeting was that. 
most of the other partners were begging India to please give some ground so that they could finally come to agreement. And it doesn't seem like India's there yet. I mean, you could blame the impasse on the Chinese just as well, because you have problems in the two sides of each issue. But so I, I, I see what you're saying, that it's not a binary choice, and you're not trying to shut off China. But on the, on the sort of upside of it, can you reach a trade agreement with China? Let's see. Let's reach a trade agreement with the US next week, and then we can <laughs> see. <laughs> yeah, OK. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Yeah, blocking imports from China is a tier one policy priority, trade agreements or not. So I, I don't think a substantive agreement in RCEP, I don't think it'll happen. They may sign an agreement if, they, if all members agree to water it down. Opening up the floodgates more, like, I mean, unless you have a change in government or... Argument, isn't that an argument for the others to not invite you to the next round and say, okay, fine, you know, in a nice way. I'm sure you have these same working. conversations, Walter. A lot of the other members, yeah. privately, they agree. Yeah. They're a little nervous about it, too. I mean, most already have decent market access, irrespective of a deal. But, you know, I wonder, this is supposition, whether the others are kind of thankful, maybe, in some ways, that they're not getting bigger access. You know, China's not getting bigger. So my, my word's not theirs. But uh, there may be others that share Might India's concern. Problem. Could, be. But, but, Could but be. but in the case of ASEAN, they already have an agreement. Um, and, and in case of some of the others, too, they, they have agreement with China, Australians, and the Koreans. But they're also, like, a lot of these other negotiators, too, they're, they really do want access to the Indian market. So getting them in, well, you know. That's so true. That, yeah. That's where a huge amount of the value comes, yeah. uh, comes from the agreement. Um, I did want to, uh, well, let, let's get another question. Then I do have one I want to I want to make sure we have time for. I just want to add to what, what Ela said. India has now become the battleground for US and China on technology investments. The amount of portfolio investments done by China in Indian tech startups is much more than what the American direct uh, technology companies' investments is, mm. is in India. So we, I don't think we need to choose between, or we don't have to have an FTA with China to get that, that, that trade sorted out. It's not like how this country wants to make sure that there should be an FDA and then everything will be perfectly rainbow uh, scenario. That's not the case with China. It, and, and I agree with what Rick said. Probably the other RCEP members are sort of thanking India because we are just not bending backwards to make sure that if China gets access to the Indian market for goods and products, mm -hmm. India does get access to the service industry for the rest of the RCEP members. And that's something that India is not backing it down on. So I agree with right. you. I mean, I. I, I got to admit, I doubt that a little bit. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't some members, but I think if, that, that have reservations. But I think if you're a member of the negotiations, it, it would be appropriate, given all that everyone's just said, it would be appropriate for you to n ask India to leave the negotiations. I mean, if you're involved in negotiation where you never intend to reach agreement, what the hell are you doing? You know, except blocking, except blocking it. And maybe you're right. Maybe there are a country here or there that would rather see it blocked. But so many of them already have a trade agreement with, with China. I mean, I most of them are. Like Walter, trade most agreement. of the conversations I've got negotiating partners, they won't do that because they do want India in. They want yes, the access no, to that, that market. So I wasn't trying yeah. to say a majority yeah, are behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there are some that I just wonder, you know, but is Well, that's is true. That's the India. other part. That's the other part of it. India. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's a good point. Yeah. That's certainly true. That's certainly true. Okay, the, the one thing I wanted to make sure we, we, we got to was in discussing a little bit more detail um, is the uh, prospects of an agreement. That's, you know, just reference that, a prospects of an agreement in, in New York and, and what might be included in it. Um, in addition to, uh, I guess, the, the many issues that sort of led to the impasse over you know, negotiations in the spring, um, you know, medical devices um, and the rest. You know the, the list of, of issues on the U.S. side. Uh, there's also the um, Indian retaliation for the uh, iron and uh, aluminum tariffs, and there's the prospect of a 301 investigation that the administration has left out there. It, so what are the prospects, and what is the range of um, possibilities including some of those issues you don't hear much mentioned in the context of the talks. 
Uh, well, yeah, I think some of the things that are on the U.S. agenda, India could move on without breaking the political bank back home. Uh, they've already offered a, a basic model on how they could change this uh, price caps uh, on uh, price controls on medical devices, offering graduated uh, increases at every stage, you know, of distribution. Um, heavy motorcycles, we all know there's not a lot of production in India domestically, and that's something that the president personally, you know, cares about. There's a wide range of uh, areas in agriculture that India's got uh, different types of uh, import uh, regulations that have impaired American companies, not just dairy. So uh, maybe a few uh, nodules here and there on, on those kind of things. So I think there's a few that, um, you know, India wouldn't, I think, cause a lot of domestic pain to do. But again, you know, as I sort of mentioned in my opening, uh, the bigger question in me is like, you know, would India ever sign a one-sided agreement where they make all these concessions and the United States offers nothing? So what would the United States put in comparison with what I think is a, a level of of contributions to an agreement that India could make. Would the United States agree not to uh, take away this uh, spouse worker thing that the president's got control of uh, for H-1B workers? Um, would we talk about not doing 301 for sure? We promise we won't do 301. Would they restore GSP? That's a pretty high threshold, I think, um, to, to be able to do. So uh, I'm a little more puzzled about what the United States is willing to put. We focused a lot on the Indian agenda. We know what India would like to see from the United States. You know, take them out of the uh, the next round of 232 if it happens on auto components, things like that. Uh, visas, immigration, GSP restoration. Like, we know what the limit, the, the universe is. But um, what is the United States willing to do? I think it's a little trickier. So uh, I, I just can't wait to see, you know, if they release a document. I figure it's got to have some two-way. The U.S. agenda and what we're willing to put on paper, I think, is a little tougher to guess than the Indian side. I mean, that's a common theme across our negotiating uh our negotiations currently going on. It's a, it's a mysterious sort of negotiating uh, style, I would say. That, you know, I, I get everything and you don't get anything, except I won't hurt you anymore. Yeah. You know, and that's like a, But that's a step in the right direction. I mean, if they come to agree and they at least put a pause, because, I mean, as of a month ago, I mean, both sides felt like they're teeing up more arrows to shoot at each other. So it's a good step if they are able to finalize and come to something. And you think some of these, well, you mentioned the 301, sort of refraining from that could be on the table. And, and also, um, you, you think the um, steel and aluminum tariffs and the retaliation are also part of, part of that. Yeah, I mean, we all know what the items are in the mix, but nobody at the table has, I think, stated what they, what they think a, a package could look like. So we're just kind of guessing, because on both sides, you know, you got a half dozen or so issues that we know have been kind of the main points of contention. But what they're able to cobble together, and I gather talks are still underway, so uh, they don't know either how much they're going to be able to put on the table. But, but, but coming from you, because you do know this stuff and you follow it more closely than anyone, or, or as much as anyone in town, uh, given what you said, it would imply that we're not on the cusp of an agreement. Because, uh, because if it's still all that uncertain, how do we get to yes next week? Well, anybody that's been involved in negotiations, nuclear agreement, everything else. I mean, there are always negotiators at the table until the heads of state walk in the door trying to get initials on point eleven on page 75. So I'm not worried that it's not okay. done yet. I'm not worried about that at all. The biggest things we've done for the most part are still under negotiation until they come in. And sometimes somebody's asked to block the door for a minute so they get five yeah. extra minutes, you know. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I thought you were going to say until the last minute when the president walks in and tears up the agreement. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Not that that hasn't happened before, but uh, mm. but at any rate, um, I want to thank you all for what has been a really terrific, terrific discussion. Thank you.